Amen. This morning, how true is that song for us? I don't know where you are at individually or as a family, but I do know this, that we need the Spirit to lead us. That we need to let the Spirit control us rather than let the Spirit of this age control us. It says in 1 Timothy, actually I think it's 2 Timothy, that God did not give us a spirit of fear or timidity, but one of love, power, and a sound mind. And that's what we need in these days, amen? If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. That's where we'll start this morning. So as you turn there, I will tell you a little story um, that just happened to me, actually. But we're, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. And so this morning, as we were coming to Lodi Community Church uh, from Elk Grove, we decided to stop at Starbucks. I have my tech helpers, Amara, Savannah, and Kayla. They're doing a wonderful job. And as we were needing some coffee and some butter croissants, we pulled into the Lodi Starbucks on Ham Lane, and it was great. We got it, got out pretty fast, arrived at the church, pulled into the parking lot, and I was getting ready to come out and set all this up, and I was probably in a hurry, a little rushed, and boom! Hit my full venti cup of cold brew, salted caramel, cold foam cup everywhere. And it spilled all over me, all over my lap. And I was sitting in my coffee in my car before I came into the building. It was great. <laughs> oh man, it, it was uh, one of those moments where you have to go, what am I going to do? Am I going to be anxious and freak out, or am I going to take a deep breath, trust God, go get some paper towels, and wipe off? And luckily, it doesn't look too bad. I, I, don't, I can't really see anything on my person, my clothes. So if you're wondering you know, why it may look wet down there on my legs, it's, it's not what you think. I spilled my coffee, and I apologize. But this allows us to think about something what happens when life goes, takes an unexpected turn? What happens when the world shuts down because of a viral pandemic like COVID-19? We live in a day and an age where everything is accessible to us on demand. Um, it's pretty amazing that I was able to watch videos or movies that were in theaters just like that on my TV by pushing a button and paying a small fee. We can order, well, we could order toilet paper and other necessities, books, electronics, clothes on Amazon at the push of the button. And with Prime, you get it like in one to two days. We lived in a society just a few weeks ago, a month ago, that anything was on demand. And then this small, microscopic virus threw a wrench in the whole system. And before COVID-19, we were an anxious society. The tensions were mounting in politics and around the world, especially in the United States, as the right and the left butted heads and other ideologies were fiercely debated. We were a tense, anxious, emotional, in turmoil society but then all but we had our comfort we had our convenience we had our entertainment we had our nfl and nba we had everything that we needed and then covid 19 happens and now we are all panicking not all of us but many are panicking you can hear it in the voices you can hear it in the Twitter stream. You can hear it in the videos on Facebook and on CNN and on Fox News. There is panic and there is fear. There is anxiety. You see, we live in this anxious society, in an anxious system. And some research has 
told us what happens when we are anxious, when we are dealing with anxiety. And let me list off a few things that happen when a person or a system, a system of persons, becomes anxious. What anxiety does to repress a person or system? It, number one, decreases our capacity to learn. It replaces curiosity with a demand for certainty. So instead of imagining, instead of creativity, we demand certainty. We must know what is happening. It stiffens our position over against another's. It interrupts concentration. Maybe you found yourself distracted throughout all of this ordeal. It floods the nervous system so that we cannot hear what is said without some distortion or we cannot respond with clarity. It actually has a physiological effect on our body. It simplifies ways of thinking. It's either yes, no, either, or. There is no gray area. There is no room for discernment or wisdom. It's yes, no. It's black or white. It prompts a desire for a quick fix. This needs to be fixed right now. It must. It must. Anxiety. It arouses feelings of helplessness or self-doubt. It leads to an array of defensive behaviors. I've seen on Facebook and other social media and heard from other parents that anxiety in the home is a real issue these days. Even in Texas, there were some physical abuse cases because of COVID-19 isolation. That's horrible. How are you dealing with the anxiety in your home? The, the new reality of homeschool and working from home and trying to manage a kid's schedule and learning. I saw one doctor say that it's impossible for you to be a parent, a teacher, and an employee at the same time. No wonder we are anxious. No wonder we are freaking out. And it's arousing these feelings of helplessness, self-doubt, defensive behaviors. Have you been more defensive with your spouse or your children? I've caught myself at times being anxious, overstimulated and snapping. It diminishes our flexibility in response to life's challenge. No longer are we adaptable, but we are less flexible and we just can't seem to respond as little challenges come our way, let alone bigger challenges that may be on the horizon because of all the financial downturn in our economy. Perhaps you've lost a job or been laid off or been furloughed and you're anxious and you don't know what to do. It creates an imaginative gridlock. We are not able to think of alternatives, options, or new perspectives. We're, we're at a halt. We're stopped. We, we cannot see further than what's right in front of us. It's an anxious blindness. You see, we were anxious before COVID-19. But now anxiety is ramped up. You can feel it. You can taste it. Anxiety is in the air. Another research has shown that anxiety is contagious. When anxiety is introduced into a system, it could be a church, it could be a business, it could be a nation. When anxiety is introduced into a system, it's contagious. It spreads like a virus. So what do we do with anxiety? What do we do with our fear? What do we do with these feelings of aloneness and a loss of control and uncertainty and insecurity? Because as the church right now, we, we stand in a unique opportunity to reach out to others that are anxious. But that means that we must not be anxious ourselves. You see, right now, the world needs your non-anxious presence. The greatest gift, one counselor said, the greatest gift, his name is Rich Plass, one, the greatest gift that you can give to one another, to the world, is your transformed presence. Your non-anxious 
presence. The greatest gift that you can give to your children, that you can give to your spouse, that you can give to your neighbor, that you can give to the barista or the grocer is your non-anxious presence. When I was waiting in line one early morning to see what I could find at the grocery store, I was in line and you could tell that the clerk was, was, sh was shaking and rattled. And they were working 14 hour days, they were just overwhelmed. And it was a simple smile and how are you and thank you that transformed her countenance. It transformed our conversation and you could see the, the weight just drip off of her shoulders. You see, what the world needs is our non-anxious presence, or what one author said, is the ability to be controlled by the Spirit and not by the Spirit of this age. Romans 12, 2 says that we are not to be conformed by the pattern of this world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We must begin to see things differently. We must experience repentance. Jesus said that we are to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Repentance is to change our mind, to turn from what is wrong and evil or the, of the pattern of this world and to turn 180 towards God, to run towards his thoughts, his way, his will, his word, his voice, his spirit and not the spirit of the age. We must be a people controlled by the spirit, led by the spirit. That's why I played that song, Spirit, Lead Me This Morning, because I want that to be our prayer, church. I want that to be our heart in this time. Spirit, lead me. But in order for that to happen, we must take a posture of renewal. We must position ourselves to receive. We must go to the source. Because in our hectic, frenetic life, we oftentimes are running around. And perhaps you could imagine with me a pitcher, and it's being poured out water, life-giving water. But us, our soul, it's like a cup, and we are running from this sport to this job, to this task, to this chore, to this Netflix special, to this social media outlet, and we are running all over and all along. God is simply wanting to pour out his life giving water, but we are all over the place. And what we have in front of us, church, is God through this, not that God planned this pandemic, but he knew that it would happen. And as in Romans 8, he will make everything good for those who believe. And so he is using this, I believe, to reboot the system, to call the church to draw near to him, as we talked about last week, to draw near to him in the secret place. He's saying, stop and let me pour my life giving water my spirit to your soul so that you would be a non-anxious presence, which could be, quite frankly, the most powerful apologetic in our day. A non-anxious presence, controlled, led by the fruit or the spirit of God, and then bearing the fruit of the spirit of love and joy and peace and patience, kindness. This is our goal, church, that we are to make fruitful, gospel-formed disciples, that we would see a gospel renewal in Lodi from disciples' lives that are flourishing, that people look from the outside and it makes Jesus irresistible because in an anxious society, a non-anxious soul is an anomaly, a remedy, it's hope. And church, this is what I want to talk about in these coming weeks. How do we develop a non-anxious presence? And the text this morning is out of Matthew chapter 11. And in Jesus' day, they were anxious as well. And the religious institutions, the Pharisees, didn't help. There's some 600 and 13 laws in the Old Testament and the Pharisees would add on those laws and just burden down the people with guilt and shame and you're not good enough 
They would burden them. And Jesus, as another rabbi, a greater teacher, comes and he says this to those that are anxious and burdened down by religion. He says in verse 25, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, that you offer to an anxious, burdened people a new yoke, a new teaching, a new way to live. That Jesus, in two weeks, when we celebrate your resurrection, we are celebrating the hope that you give to all who would believe. You who would trust you, who would take up your invitation to come to you and find rest for their soul. That you overcame sin and that you overcame guilt and you overcame shame and fear and death. No longer do we need to fear death. No longer do we need to fear. For you did not give us a spirit of fear, but one of power, of love. And of self-discipline, of sound mind and self-control. And that is what we want, Jesus. And so we ask as you open up the word this morning to us, we ask, Holy Spirit, whoever's watching, whoever's listening, Holy Spirit, would you would speak to their hearts and they would take you up on this invitation, Jesus, to come to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Eugene Peterson, he said... He had this to say about Matthew chapter 11, 25 through 30. This is from the message translation, and this is a commentary, you could say, about these verses. It's, it's a, some would call it a translation, but others would see it as a commentary, but it's the message. It's, it's a great reading uh, way to read through the scriptures. It gives new life and new light to the scriptures. And so the same passage that I just read from the English Standard Version, or the ESV, says this. Abruptly, Jesus broke into prayer. Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You've concealed your ways from sophisticates and know-it-alls, but spell them out clearly to ordinary people. Yes, Father, that's the way you like to work. And I don't know about you, but I'm really thankful that God chooses to reveal himself to ordinary people, that he chooses to reveal himself, as he says in the ESV, little children, those who come to him with a simple childlike faith and trust. Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly. And this morning, as you hear Jesus' words, I want you to hear Jesus speaking to you tenderly. If you've been anxious, if you've been burdened down with fear, or if you've been burdened down with guilt or uncertainty or doubt or help, uh, feelings of helplessness, I want you to hear Jesus speaking to you tenderly. The Father has given me all these things to do and say. This is a unique father-son operation. Coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge, just to pause there, it's amazing that God invites us through the Holy Spirit in these same intimacies and knowledge. The unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through the gospel, we have access to that relationship. It's truly astonishing. 
This is a unique father-son operation coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the son the way the father does, nor the father the way the son does. But I'm not keeping it to myself, thank you. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. And really, that's the invitation this morning. Are you willing to listen? Are you willing to listen to the tender Jesus who's full of grace and he's full of truth? Inviting you to come to him so that your soul may have rest, so that you may be a non-anxious presence in a world filled with anxiety and fear. It says, I'm ready to go over it line by line with you. If you're willing to listen, if you're willing to stop what you are doing and allow the Holy Spirit through the scripture to pour out Jesus's truth to you. And in this sheltering in place and in this time of isolation because of COVID-19, perhaps God is saying, stop and listen. You see, there was a time in, in my life where I was approaching burnout or perhaps burnout from ministry. It was some 16, 18 years of full-time ministry. And through different circumstances, I was toast on the inside. And in that after that season, we went on sabbatical, and in a sabbatical, you're forced to come to grips with your rhythms of life, where you're getting nourished spiritually and in your soul. And as I've prayed and as I've considered this, this you know, some, this quarantine, this who knows how long, many weeks of being isolated and being shelter, of having to shelter in place, perhaps it's a forced sabbatical on the nation, on the globe, on the church for us to re-examine our rhythms of grace. And instead of binging on Netflix or being anxious as you watch CNN or Fox News or whatever news station you watch or scrolling and listening to all the comments on Twitter or Facebook, Perhaps we could reassess and re-examine our spirituality and the state of our soul in this time. And to that point, if anyone would like to reach out to me and talk about their soul, I would be happy to set up a Zoom meeting or a phone call. This is the time, church, for us to dig in and to take up Jesus' invitation to be willing to listen and let him line by line teach us how to live. I love this last segment of Eugene Peterson's commentary on this verse. He says, are you tired? Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. Did you hear that invitation? Get away with me and you'll recover your life. Church, this is the season to get away with Jesus. To take a drive to the mountains. To go to your favorite fishing spot and just, yes, fish. But just listen and ask the Holy Spirit to speak. Read scripture. Go deep in your spirituality. This is the time. What could the church emerge from this season like? If we would draw near in the secret place, if we would draw near to God, if we would take Jesus up on his invitation to come to him. Get away with me and you'll recover your life after that sabbatical. It was hard. My soul was empty. I was burned out. I was hurt. And recovering these rhythms of grace, what I had found in my own life was that I was looking at scripture. I was looking at my relationship with God through my job, which happened to be a pastor, not drawing near to him for the sake of knowing Jesus. I simply wanted to read the scripture because I needed to preach or teach. And it sucked out the very life of my soul. And in that two years where I stepped away from ministry before coming to be on the lead pastor here, 
and I worked in the marketplace. It took time, but working through these rhythms of grace, taking Jesus up on his invitation. And it happened simply by taking up the Version app, which is a Bible reading plan, and, and trying to commit daily to just listening to the Word of God and then writing a small um, takeaway in a family group devotional on the app. And it's amazing how just posturing myself on a regular, I miss days and I would catch up, but I did finish the entire Bible that year and I just would read it and it was life to my soul. It's a little gesture, a little posture change and I begin to become alive in my soul. Jesus is asking us, he's inviting us, come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Are you tired? Are you anxious? Are you burdened? Take Jesus up on his invitation in this time. I will show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. This is what it means to be a disciple. It means to follow Jesus, to learn, to be his apprentice. To come under his teaching, to come under his yoke, to learn how he lives, how he loves the Father. This is a great line. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. How do the rhythms of grace change us. How do others call them spiritual disciplines? Others call them uh, means of grace. Some call them gospel rhythms. But these are the practices that we do to form our soul and to draw near to God. Like scripture reading and meditating on scripture. Prayer and fasting and silence and solitude. Mission and service. These are the things that God gives us. These, they're not forced. They're not manipulated. Jesus didn't, doesn't want to manipulate you or guilt you to do them. He invites you to life. He invites you to have a life to the full. That's what he said he came for. He came that we might have life and life more abundantly. He wants us to have fruitful and flourishing lives that make him irresistible in our city. He says, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Thank you, Jesus. He's speaking tenderly to us. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Oh. Would you just take Jesus at his word and come to him during this season, during this kind of forced sabbatical? I know some of us are still dealing with household chores and homeschooling and working from home. It, it, it's not perfect. It's not ideal. But if you have time, I'm imploring you, don't waste this opportunity to draw near to God. Take walks by yourself. Learn to sit at the feet of Jesus. As he says here, keep company with me. Keep company with Jesus. And you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Christian philosopher Dallas Willard, author of The Divine Conspiracy and Renovation of the Heart, he makes note of this simple yet profound connection. He says this, My central claim is that we can become like Christ by doing one thing, by following him in the overall style of life he chose for himself. If we have faith in Christ, we must believe that he knew how to live. Astonishing idea, right? If we are trusting Jesus with everything, then we should trust how he lived his life. We can, through faith and grace, become like Christ by practicing the types of activities he engaged in. By arranging, arranging our whole lives around the activities he himself practiced in order to remain constantly at home in the fellowship of his Father. Online, I've been going over uh, what it means to be united with Christ or what theologians would call union with Christ. But beyond that academic pursuit of understanding what our union with Christ is, we must commune with Christ. That is the enjoyment and experience of our union with Christ by the Holy Spirit. And that happens 
when we keep company with him, when we arrange our whole life around him and learn from him. Even Jesus, after long days of ministry, he would withdraw to silent and isolated and lonely places. Why? So that he could draw near to the Father and be restored. Even in, this is the amazing thing about Jesus. He was 100% God and he was 100% man. And in his humanity, he knew that to be fully human, he had to draw near to his Father and to be empowered by that relationship and that love and that fellowship and that communion. How much more, church, do we need to draw near to him? And through the gospel, he's made a way. He has opened up the curtain so that we could draw near through faith by grace to Christ. He is our living water. Again, the world needs your non-anxious presence. But... Unless you have rhythms of communion and prayer, scripture reading, silence, solitude, these rhythms of grace, these unforced rhythms of grace, you will simply be at the mercy of the anxiety of your circumstances. Therefore, how do we do this? How do we no longer conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind? We must take a posture of renewal. You see, God renews churches through renewed people. So we must start with ourselves, church. This includes me, everyone watching. If we want to see God do a, a, a renewal or a revival in our day, then we must seek God. We must take on a posture of renewal. We must draw near to him in the secret place. We must take Jesus up on his invitation and keep company with him and learn from him. The only way to be Christ-like is to draw near to Christ and allow him by the Spirit to form us into his image. And he will use suffering, and he will use trials, and he will use our posture. He will use everything if we allow him. If as that cup, we would just simply come and find ourselves drawing near and allowing him to pour out his life-giving water in us. You see, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he was a, a preacher, good preacher, one that I admire. He says that renewal happens when people come to the end of themselves. And perhaps in all of this, people are coming to the reality that they've built their life on fantasy. NBA, infill, all these entertainment sports figures, they're no longer working. And we can't order on Amazon. We can't have our, 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 our Starbucks like we want it all the time. We have to wait in line. We have to go through drive through All these things that we built our life on that makes us happy, it's been shaken been shaken. Perhaps we have learned in this time more than anything our limitations. Perhaps we're being shown just how needy we are that a microscopic virus can shut down the world. Our limitations are being exposed. Mark Sayers, who some would see it as a prophetic voice and an excellent cultural commentator. He, he thinks that this is a reboot of the system, that the system is shutting down and is being rebooted. But the question is, is what type of habits, what type of people will we, be, will we have when this goes away? This is our opportunity to what some would call a fruitful dormancy, like we talked about last week in the process of germination, how when a seed goes in the ground, it's dormant. It's hidden, it's secret. But when the environment triggers this process, enzymes begin to happen, roots begin to go down deep, buds begin to go up and reach for the sun. This is the process of germination, this is growth. And perhaps in this season of dormancy, it would be a fruitful dormancy. And at the other side of this, we would be a different church, a different people, one who has used this time, made the most of it to draw near to him and take Jesus up on his invitation. 
Church, let this be a fruitful dormancy. But renewal is a gift. I cannot manufacture renewal. I cannot work it up. I cannot choose it. I cannot decide to be renewed. Renewal is a gift. It is a sovereign gift from God. But we can position ourselves to receive. There is this amazing illustration and analogy that uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty gave about sleep. How I'm just going to read the, the quote because I found it so interesting when we're talking about posture and having a posture of renewal. Listen to this. I cannot choose to fall asleep. And I know some of us w wish we could outside of some medicine or, you know, some anesthesia. We cannot choose to fall asleep. The best I can do is choose to put myself in a posture and rhythm that welcomes sleep. I lie down in bed on my left side with my knees drawn up. I close my eyes. I breathe slowly, putting my plans out of mind. But the power of my will or consciousness stops there. I cannot choose to go to sleep. I can only position myself. I can only take the posture of a sleeper. But I cannot decide to go to sleep. I want to go to sleep, and I've chosen to climb into bed, but in another sense, sleep is not something under my control or at my beck and call. I call up the visitation of sleep by imitating the breathing and posture of a sleeper. There is a moment when sleep comes. Settling on this imitation of itself, which I have been offering to it, and I succeed in becoming what I was trying to be. Sleep is a gift to be received, not a decision to be made. And yet it is a gift that requires a posture of reception, a kind of active welcome. Church, I hope you heard that because in this season, we need to take a kind of active welcome for renewal. We need to learn the posture of renewal, uh, learn the practices of silence, solitude, of scripture, of learning the voice of God in the morning, awaking the dawn with our praise. We need to learn how to posture ourselves so that we would be renewed. I cannot choose today to be a renewed person. I cannot choose what my desires are. I cannot change my heart, but God can. But I must posture myself in faith. I must come to Jesus. I must take him up at his word and keep company with him. I must stop what I'm doing and draw near. I must leverage the secret place. Take this time, church, of being sheltered in place and draw near to God so that our souls would be refreshed and restored. I love what C.S. Lewis said. The first job each morning consists in shoving all other voices all back in listening to that other voice and taking that other point of view, letting that other larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in. And I have been guilty of this church, and this is just as much a challenge to me as it is to you. Sometimes the first thing I do in the morning, I roll over and I grab my phone and I start flipping up the Twitter feed or look at my news app or see what someone texts me or emailed me. My commitment, my posture that I want to begin to implement in my own life is a posture that C.S. Lewis described that the first job of every morning would consist in shoving all those other voices back and listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in, going to Jesus and letting him speak life to me so that I could have a non-anxious presence in this world. That's the greatest gift. My transformed presence is the greatest gift I can give to my spouse. I can give to my family and I can give to my neighbors and to the world. How many times have we allowed anxiety to creep in and we snap at our kids, we snap at our spouse? I am guilty of this, and this is a challenge to me. It's I am taking up Jesus' invitation. I want to come near to him. I want to draw near to him. I want to keep company with him. I want to be with Jesus. 
in closing, and we'll spend more time on this next week, but I'll give you a little, a little taste. In Psalm 1, we, we hear kind of an introduction to the whole book of Psalms. This sets the tone for the entire book of Psalms, of how we worship, of how we relate to God. And listen to the words of the psalmist. Blessed or happy. Happy. For those that are anxious, I know what they crave. They want to be happy. And here, the psalmist, inspired by the Holy Spirit, gives us the path. Blessed or happy is the man or woman who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. The word there for law is the word Torah, which could mean the, five, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But it also means, in a larger sense, the entire instruction and teaching of God. And it says that this person who is happy, who is blessed, he is meditating day and night, all the time, on the teaching, on the instruction, the yoke that Jesus' words of Jesus, of God, his word. And because he does, he's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. But did you see that the blessed man, he first has to say no to the counsel of the wicked. He has to say no as he stands in the way of sinners. He has to say no to sitting in the seat of mockers. And he has to say yes to the word of God. And for us, church, that means saying yes to Jesus' invitation. Yes to Jesus' invitation. So again, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Run to Jesus. Church, run to Jesus. If you need help, if you need coaching, if you need help in this discipleship process, I will be gladly there through Zoom or a phone call or a text to help you along this journey. We're in this together, but let us take up Jesus at his word and get away with him so that we recover our life that we are transformed. Let him show us how to take a real rest. Let us walk with him and work with him. Let, him. let us watch how he does it as we read scriptures and are instructed by the Holy Spirit. Let us learn the unforced rhythms of grace. He promises not to lay anything too heavy or ill-fitting on us. If we would keep company with Jesus, we'll learn how to live freely and live lightly. So a few things to take away that maybe we can discuss on Facebook or through Zoom or other means. What voice do you listen to in the morning, right when you get out of bed? What's the first voice that you allow to shape you and transform you? Is it the life-giving voice of Jesus through his scripture? through his spirit, or is it something else? What is the voice that you listen to before you go to bed? Is it the TV? Is it news? Does it make you more anxious? Is it TikTok? Is it social media? <clears throat> is it a book? What voice do you listen to before you go to bed? And then answer this, how is that voice shaping you? What is it producing in you? What fruit is it producing in you? Is it producing anxiety? Is it producing comparison? Is it producing competition? Or is it producing life, truth, wisdom, peace, patience? And lastly, what new posture of renewal do you need to implement in your life? Think about this, church. Renewal, just like sleep, is a gift. How are you preparing? What kind of active welcome are you implementing in your life to receive the gift of Jesus, his life, his abundant, 
life to the full, glorious life that he promises. We cannot avoid him by being busy and frenetic and hectic and expect him to chase us around when he's invited us to come to the living water, to come to the well, and to receive his life-giving water. This is rest for our soul. This is restoring our soul. This is life, church. And this is how we become transformed with a non-anxious presence. And the world will take note. The world will find Jesus irresistible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the invitation that you give to us to follow you, to apprentice under you, to come to you and find rest. That your yoke, it is not heavy. It is not a burden. So help us become pupils of Jesus, learners, disciples, apprentices of Jesus. Help us learn a posture of renewal. Help us change our hearts, wet our appetite to delight Ourself in your teaching, in your way, in your yoke, in your Torah. Holy Spirit, we need you for this. We cannot manufacture it. We cannot modify our behavior to achieve it. We must, as little children, posture ourselves in front of a loving Father who has given us everything in Jesus and the Spirit, and to receive this grace, to receive this love, and to live out a life that is so different that we shine like stars in a crooked and depraved generation. Jesus, help us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Like last week, we're going to just have some time to reflect and to process this. If you have questions or comments, please post them on Facebook or the webpage. But I'm going to go back there and I'm going to turn on one last song, and it's called God of Revival. And, it, and would you just let this be your prayer? Would this let be your anthem in this season? God, renew us. God, lead us. Spirit, lead us. And so as you listen to this song, if you need to check out, that's fine. But if you tarry with us, please pray this, sing this, believe this, expect this, church. It's time for us to learn how to have postures of renewal.